Let's get your week started. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market just about positive. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Live from New York, coming up, Yellen says it's all on Congress to lift the debt limit. PacWest leading the rebound after slashing its dividend and looking ahead to the latest bank lending survey. We begin with the big issue, stuck between bank stress and resilient data. The economy is pretty darn strong. The economy is resilient here. The U.S. economy has proven a lot more resilient than people thought. You've got an incredibly resilient, durable economy. But... That doesn't change the fact that there are indicators pointing to a recession. It's pretty clear that the largest banks, the smallest banks, are tightening their belt. We have a lot of questions that are that are hanging out there. In particular, of course, the tightening of credit conditions. We're seeing a tighter lending environment coming up. Metrics like the Senior Loan Officer Survey. It's going to say that credit supply is tightening. What we're left with is the Federal Reserve with a tight monetary policy in place. Things break where there are the weak links. It is democratic. We've heard that word a lot uh, for, for the U.S banking sector, but I, I don't think it's that simple. Banks will make it harder for uh, consumers and corporations to get loans. It's going to squeeze the one thing that's holding up the U.S. economy, and that's the U.S. consumer. Joining us now to discuss, Schwab's Kathy Jones, Invesco's Brian Levitt. Kathy, wonderful to start the program, start the week with you. Kathy, how long before we're talking about a June rate hike? Well, I, I think it's probably already on the table for a lot of people, but I, I really think that at this stage of the game, the Fed had indicated that they're probably on hold for a little while, and um, for good reason, that, uh, that they probably will hold off. But the talk will probably start as soon as CPI is out later today or later this week. Good news was good news on Friday. Data robust, equity market up. I wonder if that can stick, Brian. Deutsche Bank's Brett Ryan saying this. They've lost that hike in feeling. Brian, the Federal Reserve's <laughs> lost that hike in feeling. So can we enjoy, Brian, the benefits of good data without the threat of rate hikes? No, I think if, the more good, if you do get good data, then the threat of rate hikes will come back in. But I, I certainly hope that the Federal Reserve is at the end of its tightening cycle. This is an incredible amount of tightening over a very, very short period of time. And we still haven't seen the lagged effects of all of it. You know, this, as everyone says, it takes 12, 18 months to work its way through the economy. The money supply on a year-over-year -year percent change is negative. So we have a good sense of where inflation is heading. Plus, as uh, your intro suggested, the banks are tightening lending standards, which is even additional tightening on this economy. So I hope that the Federal Reserve is done um, and, and the economy will slow down given the lag effects of all of this tightening. In the meantime, then, Brian, is good news good news for this equity market? Good news will ultimately be good news because you start to get more of a soft landing feel. Now, that's not necessarily going to, maybe that's a little bit too hopeful, but that's the way the market took the jobs report, which is look, inflation's coming down. And the economy is still resilient. So the market is going to applaud that. Ultimately, I think that this economy does moderate. You will see some retracement of recent gains that we've had in the market. But that's a very tactical call. I, I would ask investors to look out over the next one or two years rather than the next couple of months. Typically, once inflation has peaked, once the Fed is done tightening, markets tend to do very well over the next couple of years, even if it's not a straight line up. Yields on Friday up. Yields this morning higher, up by eight basis points on a two-year, just short of 4% right now at 3.99. Kathy, given the conversation that we're all having at the moment, just how much upside is there at the front end of the curve? Oh, I don't think there's a whole lot more. I mean, we've got the complication of the debt ceiling in there, uh, so kind of boosting short, very short-term T-bill yields. But I don't think there's a lot more room on the upside just because I, I agree um, that we're probably done with the rate hiking cycle. It's the question is where does the intermediate long-term trend go from here? And, and we think that ultimately it goes lower because we do look for slowing in the economy, more um, downside in inflation, and an economy that may indeed tip into recession later this year. So, Kathy, 10 years right now, let's call it 350. What are you looking for? Three, down towards two? 
Yeah, we were looking, at, we've been forecasting three to three and a quarter percent for a year end. I think we're going to stick with that for the time being. Obviously, we've gotten down under 350 a little bit faster than we thought was uh, going to happen, but we're going to stick with the three to three and a quarter area. That gives you still room for inflation to run two to two and a half percent and have some sort of risk premium over that for the 10 year. CPI coming out on Wednesday, PPI coming out on Thursday. Later on this afternoon, we've been talking about this now for months, 2 p.m. Eastern time, we'll get the Fed's senior loan officer opinion survey. The consensus is that credit conditions are tightening. We're about to find out, Mike McKee, by how much? Yeah, it's kind of funny, John. If I had come to you with a senior loan officer survey two months ago, you would have heard this giant noise outside of all of Wall Street rolling their eyes. But today, it's very important. Are banks tightening credit even more? Well, you go back to January, the last time this survey was released, and they were tightening credit quite a bit. 43% said they had tightened somewhat. Only 1.5% said they'd tightened a lot. So maybe we watch the bottom line there. Uh, but is it really going to slow the economy? That's the question. Take a look at what's happened over the last month or so with all the problems we've had in banks, with the idea that banks are raising credit standards. And you can see that banks are still making loans. There was a kink when we had the crisis in the middle of March. But right now, loan growth is on its way up again. So will the senior loan officer survey tell us a whole lot? There were also concerns about whether people were pulling their money out of banks, and that would lead them to pull back. It doesn't look like it right now. We had a big drop in deposits after the bank issues in March, but now they have flattened out. So we're going to look at the senior loan officer survey, but we're probably going to have to keep an eye on the economy to really tell us whether or not banks are pulling back. Comes out quarterly, of course, Mike. And for the first time, a lot of people will read this thing because many people, many people don't need to, haven't needed to, so don't bother. Mike, when you open that up a little bit later on this afternoon, how would you say to people that they should look at it? What should they look for? Well, you want to look at the overall numbers, probably. You can break it down by large or small in terms of how many are tightening credit standards by some amount, uh, whether it's a lot or uh, somewhat. And then you want to look at what loan demand is. Loan demand has fallen off somewhat. Is it really uh, the banks tightening credit or do businesses feel like they don't need credit at this point? Mike McKee, thank you. Kathy Jones, I want to come to you on that. Mike McKee's been talking about this for a while. We all have May 8th. May 8th has arrived. We're going to get this data out a little bit later on this afternoon. We get weekly information from the Federal Reserve. We can get it from individual banks. We understand businesses from them individually about their access to credit at the moment. What is this going to tell us later on this afternoon that we don't know already? Yeah, I think it's more a matter of degree. I think we do know that banks are tightening lending standards uh, and that demand is down as the economy slows. And uh, debt levels have moved up fairly significantly for small and medium-sized businesses. So I, I think that uh, if I can tell us anything new, it's either going to confirm our prior um, expectations or maybe it will not be quite as severe as the expectations are. But keep in mind, this is the first quarter. So a lot of the banking stress that we've seen has happened late in the first quarter. Uh, and into April. So it may not totally reflect the, the current state of tightness in, in lending standards at the, uh, center, at, the, at the major banks, or the medium-sized banks in particular. Brian Levitt, how useful is this later on this afternoon? I think it is useful. I mean, we know how cycles play out. And even though this is a very bizarre, unique pandemic cycle, it's playing out the way all cycles play out in that Fed raises rates to control inflation, growth slows, and the banks tighten lending standards. And as that's happening, spreads start to move out a bit. Um, and so I think it is important. I agree that we, we already kind of sense this. We already kind of know it. But it's all about where are we going here, not the, from here, not the lag data. Where are we going forward? And I think it's pretty clear that banks are tightening lending, lending standards and the, the economy is going to slow here. But what everyone gets so concerned, um, is this the recession? What I also remind people is this is how new cycles play out. All right. So as the banks tighten lending standards, monetary policy shifts, that's when crises start to fade and ultimately markets get ahead towards new cycles. So if you're tactical, you may want to be a little defensive in here. But again, and I said it before, over the next couple of years, we're setting up a good backdrop for markets. Well, Brian, I think that's the difficulty on a tactical basis. You're hearing a lot of people trying to price the recovery to a recession we haven't had yet. 
They want the best of both worlds. They want to price in the rate cuts and all the good stuff. They want to avoid the bad data and look ahead to the better stuff. Well, this that's is why from Mike Wilson. Found. Mike Wilson this morning from Mike from Morgan Stanley is basically saying that the equity market continues to expect the best of both worlds, rate cuts and durable growth. We view the likelihood of both of those outcomes playing out in concert this year as low. Equities are priced for an optimistic and lower probability outcome. Brian, are equities priced for an optimistic and lower probability outcome? Yeah, they're priced optimistically right now. I mean, the, the move that we saw in the beginning of the year was around the soft landing. We pulled back a little bit with some of the banking challenges and are now starting to move. Uh, we've been kind of range bound more recently. Um, you know, I think that we are going to retrace some of these recent gains as the economy rolls over. That's what history suggests. The question is, how bearish do you want to be? You know, there's some strategist out there, and I don't want to misquote Mike Wilson, but I believe thinks that the bottom isn't in. We're going to go further down, and that would that would necessitate a pretty significant deterioration in earnings, plus inflation and rates staying elevated, so you get no multiple expansion. My opinion, we are going to see earnings moderate, but as interest rates come down, you'll start to see. Um, you'll start to see multiples expand. So I hate to be the, the you know, the on the one hand, on the other hand, strategist that Harry Truman didn't want, but <laughs> it is possible we retrace a bit. How worried are you about the next, call it five, 10% move versus not trying to not miss out on the recovery, which is going to play out over the next couple of years. Brian, you're going to stick with us alongside Kathy Jones, looking at an equity market right now, about 20 minutes out from the up and inbound positive 0.1%. If you want one single name, we can pick out PacWest. Last Monday, double digit name, $10 stock. Throughout last week, got absolutely pummeled, hammered. It was pretty brutal at times. We got to as low as around 250 on that name. We're back to about 760 this morning going into the up and bow. Let's get you some movers. Here's Abby. It's simply wild trading on that PacWest, John. And let's take a look at those shares because after that big rally on Friday, the best day ever going back to 2000, up 82%. But within the worst week since March, just a piece of that volatility, up another 30% today. Uh, the company is cutting their dividend to a penny to accelerate capital build plans. I would say, though, a big piece of this bank turmoil, crisis and confidence. So right now, we have confidence restored at least for a second day. Tesla up 1.8%. The company is breaking ground on a lithium refining plant in Texas. Plus, Warren Buffett has praised Elon Musk, saying he's a brilliant guy. Those shares seem to be responding to the upside. And then finally, American Airlines upgraded to an overweight from a neutral over at J.P. Morgan. Shares up 3.5 percent. The analysts over at J.P. Morgan saying that Big Air uh, has bested the discount airlines, such as Southwest Airlines and Frontier Group. Both of those stocks are lower, but American Airlines, again, up 3.5 percent, John. Abby, thank you. We'll get you a little bit more on that Call around the up and bound. Look out for that. Futures right now up by a little more than 0.1%. Coming up, the debt ceiling debate coming to a head. These negotiations which should not take place with a gun uh, really to the head of the American people. The U.S. Treasury Secretary has a simple message for Congress. That conversation up next. These negotiations which should not take place with a gun uh, really to the head of the American people. It's Congress's job to do this. If they fail to do it, we will have an economic and financial catastrophe that will be of our own making. And um, there is no action that President Biden uh, and the U.S. Treasury can take to prevent that uh, catastrophe. Congress needs to do its job. That's the message from Secretary Yellen. The pressure to raise the debt limit mounting as President Biden prepares to sit down with congressional leaders Tuesday. This is the political divide intensifies on Capitol Hill. Senate Republicans doubling down on their agenda. More than 40 lawmakers telling Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, quote, this trajectory must be addressed with fiscal reform. For more, let's get to Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. Down at the White House, Anne-Marie, the latest, please. Well, Jonathan, tomorrow is going to be a very highly anticipated meeting. And just because of what you're learning from there, the battle lines have been hardened. And what we have now is the majority of Republican senators saying there cannot be a no strings attached. 
debt limit rise. There has to be fiscal and spending cuts attached to that. And this is something the White House does not want to see. They want to be able to get through Congress a clean debt ceiling rise. The issue they have is that they don't have the votes in Congress. So even when you have the Treasury Secretary coming out, warning about the X date being just around the corner, less than a month away, and call, saying that the Republicans have a gun to the economy's head, the end of the day, at some point, there would likely need to be a negotiation. And that is why everyone is looking at tomorrow's meeting. Biden will be sitting down with congressional leadership, most notably Speaker McCarthy. The issue that we all have is that what we're seeing, what we're witnessing, is a lot of political maneuvering going into the election next year. So let's talk about that. You get yeah. one of these every now and then. The president not exactly riding high. A bruising poll from ABC Washington Post. That poll released over the weekend. The percentage of those approving of Biden's performance has fallen to 36 percent, six points yeah. lower than in February, a point off his previous low in early 22. The detail here, AMH, 56 percent disapproved of his performance. 68% regarded Biden at 80 as too old for another term, and he does not have the lead over the former president, Donald Trump. That's certainly what's in the poll, Jonathan, from ABC Washington Post. It is a bruising one of you called it, a career low in terms of his approval rating. Uh, when it comes to the economy, they think the former president did a better job. And then, of course, his age. This is something that continues to haunt this president. He tried to make a joke about it. You were there with me at the White House Correspondents' Dinner saying, they say I'm too old, I say I'm wise. But this is obviously something that is going to continue to dog him throughout this race. What is notable in this poll, very different from some of the others we've seen is that he is lagging former President Donald Trump if there were to be a 2024 rematch of these two individuals. And the numbers here, Jonathan, are quite stark. When asked who they support in 2024, 44% said they would definitely or probably vote for Trump. More than the 38% who say they're willing to give Biden another four years. Just amazing. AMH, thank you. Amazing that we face the prospect of round two of this face-off yeah. between these two individuals, and we're talking about this one issue out loud, age and mental acuity. This is what they said about age in this poll. 68% regarded Biden at 80 as too old for another term. For Trump, 44% viewed Trump, who's 76, as too advanced in years. Participants also rated Trump's physical health and mental acuity as higher. We're going to do this for the next 18 months. Kathy Jones and Brian Levitt, nervous that I might ask them about this. I'm not going to. Kathy, I'm going to talk about the debt limit with you. Kathy, when it comes to the debt limit, I just wonder where you can get an edge, where you can get a read on a subject like this one on Wall Street. Yeah, it's difficult. We have a, a great team in Washington at Schwab who keeps us up to date on the various goings on on the Hill. And what they're, what they're telling us is that um, there's no there's no easy out here for either side. So uh, my colleague Mike Townsend has pointed out that there are 16 Republicans in Congress who have never voted to increase the debt ceiling ever under any circumstances. So given how close this is, probably the best sort of outcome we can expect is a kick the can down the road towards the fall when the budget negotiations begin. And that's just going to mean more fiscal tightening ahead of us. Us, most likely. So um, I think the only way we, we can play this is to stand back, be careful, uh, particularly at the short end of the yield curve in case there's a technical default, uh, but also anticipate tighter fiscal policy down the road, which kind of reinforces our view that the economy will continue to soften into the end of the year. Brian, given this near-term risk, why wouldn't I just sell in May and run away? <laughs> well, historically, selling in May and running away has not worked for investors. If you look at it long term, you've been far better off uh, investing for the long term rather than trying to get out and get back in every November. Um, you know, look, the, the last time we did this was in 2011, and um, the market did fall. The S&P 500 fell 17 percent um, from July through September as we were grappling with it. Now, that represented a very good buying opportunity in what was the early days of a new cycle. It was short-lived, um, and ultimately, like Churchill said, Americans did the right thing, but only after exhausting all other options. I find it very difficult to try and structure a portfolio around geopolitical risk or political risk, because as soon as you think uh, you have a, a reasonable understanding of how it's going to play out, the opposite tends to happen. So I wouldn't want to try and get too cute around 
timing my portfolio based on uh, the whims of, uh, of a handful of politicians in Washington. And Kathy, do you think that some of these companies are trying to time some debt issuance here? I'm thinking of Apple earlier this morning, five part offering, $5 billion deal expected to price a little bit later. I understand from the team here at Bloomberg we could get anywhere from $30 billion to $35 billion of high-grade bond issuance this week. Do you think, Kathy, there's a window here to issue some debt ahead of what potentially might be a mess later on in the summer? Yeah, I think that that's a, probably what a lot of corporate treasurers are thinking about right now, that they've got a little bit of time before this becomes even more tumultuous and, and potential um, sell off in risk assets if we do get down to the wire or we have some sort of technical default. If I were in their, their shoes, I'd probably be doing the same thing. Uh, yields are still pretty attractive and um, they, can, they can do some financing now and stay away from all the volatility that could be ahead of us. But Kathy, it's so bizarre, isn't it? This is not about ability to pay. We've got the money in America. It's about, suppose, willingness, whether they'd actually come to an agreement and deliver the goods. Yeah, it's a replay of 2011 in that way. Um, and we saw in 2011, the oddity was that ultimately, um, when, it, when we had that moment, when we had the downgrade, um, long-term treasuries rallied. And I think that the, uh, the market knows that the U.S. can pay the bills. It, it is the downgrade was about the unwillingness to pay the bills. And so in 2011, what we saw was the expectation that we would get a, a weaker economy, lower inflation, all that turmoil, and people ran to long-term treasuries. It wouldn't surprise me if that happened again. Uh, again, you would like to think that maybe something can be worked out in Washington before we get to this kind of moment where we get another downgrade. But yep. um, 2011 teaches us that um, anything is possible. Is it different this time? Kathy Jones, Brian Levitt, for the two of you, thank you. Coming up on this program, the morning calls and later, there's no alternative to tech. That's the view from City Stuart Kaiser. Why he's staying long the sector? We'll catch up with him around the open and bow. Equity futures right now, positive 0.1%. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes out from the first opening bell of the week. Equity futures up by about 0.1%. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Stiefel. Downgrading workday to hold. $200 price target expecting limited upside with recent checks pointing to lackluster bookings. BMO upgrading Peloton to market perform, seeing a favorable risk reward with concerns now priced into shares. And finally, JP Morgan downgrading Southwest Airlines to neutral, recommending U.S. carriers with bigger international exposure instead. That stock, $29.50 in the pre-market. Coming up, Citigroup's Stuart Kaiser making a case for more big tech outperformance. That conversation up next, your opening bell, just around the corner. Twenty-three seconds away from the opening bell. Let's get your trading week started. Equity futures right now positive, just by 0.1% on the Nasdaq 100. Just a little softer, lighter, to lower, negative here by 0.15%. Also going into a key week on Wednesday CPI, the day after that PPI. There's your opening bell. Switch on the board and get to the bond market. Going into that, yields are higher by seven basis points, 3.51 on a 10-year, a little bit later on this afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern time, the Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey, much anticipated. Look out for that. Mike McKee is going to break that down for you later on this afternoon. In the FX market, the euro, 110.38, positive two-tenths of 1%. To the euro's favour, euro stronger, dollar just a touch weaker, and crude higher by more than three percentage points, $73.00 and about 60 cents right now. About 20 seconds into the session, let's get you some scores. On the S&P 500, we are positive 0.1% on the NASDAQ. We are going nowhere. One sector to watch at the open, the regionals. PacWest leading the rebound after slashing its quarterly dividend. The CEO saying this, reducing the dividend was a prudent step to accelerate our plans to build capital. Our business remains fundamentally sound. Shanali has more. Hey, Shanali. Hey, John. When we look at PacWest, remember, we're looking at a bank that sold off by more than 40 percent last week alone amid the fears in the regional banking system. Now, listen, usually when a bank cuts its dividends, that is seen as a negative for the market. In this instance, you're seeing that big jump back after that massive sell-off last week in the vein that they are looking to preserve capital. Now, remember, we have also reported 
reported that PacWest in particular has been uh, considering strategic options. There was another bit of negative news that came out late last week. This is idea that Fitch has placed it on a negative watch, and that is in part because of those strategic options. This idea here about the uncertainty about the strategic direction of a bank. Up till this point, we have talked about the pressure on net interest income. We have talked about the pressure on deposit flows in the banking system, and now the market is turning its attention to these bigger problems about what is a regional bank and is this business model sustainable. That is front and center with this Fitch notice on PacWest. But again, this is a bit of relief here. We know that when it comes to the idea of short selling, still allowed in these markets. We are waiting to see what the SEC has to say about this sector as a whole, as even though you're seeing a green day, a lot of the worries under the surface persist. Remember, one last thing here, John, we are turning attention not just to commercial real estate, but other types of loans like auto as well, uh, keeping a close eye under the surface. Shinani, thank you. Some of these names trading like penny stocks. Let's just leave that board up. Pack West at 750. Bear in mind last Monday it opened up at 1014. By the time we got to Thursday intraday the low was 248. 248. Back in Europe when we used to cover the Eurozone debt crisis, Greek banks, the price of them got so low you just stopped quoting the percentage point move. 745 is a 29% move this morning, which is about a dollar and 60 cents higher on that name. We'll pick up on that story later. Let's turn to the airlines. President Biden expected to unveil new efforts to benefit stranded travelers. That's coming up at 1:45 Eastern time. Kelly Lines has more. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Yeah, President Biden will be speaking alongside Secretary of uh, Transportation Pete Buttigieg at the White House. And what they are expected to unveil is new rules that would mandate that airlines provide meals, hotels, and additional compensation for travelers on severely delayed or canceled flights. It also, uh, we understand, would force airlines to improve the availability of customer service during periods uh, of widespread delays or cancellations. I know probably all of us have experienced that kind of headache, John. This also, according to Bloomberg's report, will include a revamp of flightrights.gov. That is a Department of Transportation website that basically shows what airlines have what compensation-related policies. That was initially unveiled, uh, rolled out last year, and as a result, many airlines did then explicitly state what their policies were. So there is a question of how much actually laying out uh, full regulation will make a difference when some airlines have already taken action on their own. But according to officials at the White House, what they hope is that airlines will expand their policies beyond just refunds uh, that customers are given in the, these kind of scenarios. Interesting, though, John, you don't necessarily see too much of a share reaction to the downside as a result of the idea of more regulation and having to pay out more to some customers. Largely airline stocks on the upswing today. Southwest, one exception. It's down just a few tenths of 1%. Hey, Kelly, thanks for that. Let's stay there. Southwest is negative 0.3%. American is up by 3.5%. Here's a why. JP Morgan downgrading Southwest, upgrading American. The analyst saying this, the long-term relationship between discounters and the big three has inverted. It's now the larger airlines that control the high ground. Simply put, shares of American are too attractive to ignore, particularly during a time of significant international demand growth. American right now, about four minutes into the session, is higher by about 3%. I want to get to the earnings. This from Tyson Foods, recording its biggest drop in over three years after cutting its full-year sales forecast. The CEO saying, quote, a challenging market as consumers switch to cheaper goods. Kelly Greifau, that does not look good over there, does it? No, not at all for the biggest American meat company. Cattle prices are at a record. We know that the cost of animal feed is rising as well. And like the CEO said, the you have consumers trading down to cheaper foods. You add it all together, and that is hitting Tyson's bottom line in a big way. The company now sees revenue between 53 and $54 billion this year. Previously, that forecast had been between 55 and $57 billion. So that explains the big drop in shares today, down about 13% at the moment. That is the biggest drop since March 2020. Not a superlative you love to see. But let's get specific on that trade down, because you had beef sales decline about 2.9% percent pork prices dropping by more than 10 percent the good news if there is good news is that poultry sales actually climbed a little bit and we know that tyson is trying to beef up if you will its chicken segment it said in march that it's going to close two of its underperforming poultry operations so we'll see how that plays out hey, katie thank you no one wants a reference to 2020 not many good things happened in spring 2020 the biggest one day drop there since that period on tyson potentially we're down by about 13 percent in tech 
Apple tap into debt markets. Bloomberg Learning, the company, is set to kick off a five-part corporate bond sale that could lift issuance by more than five billion. Ed Ludlow has more. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Five billion dollars, you said, in as many as five parts, according to our Bloomberg source. It's interesting because the longest portion of the deal, a 30-year bond, could yield around 135 basis points over comparable treasuries, according to that source. The timing is kind of interesting. I think we have as many as 15 issuers looking at the market this Monday. We get CPI Wednesday, PPI Thursday trying to get some stuff done probably before that data print later on in the week. The other the way to look at it is this is this a sign of the, the corporate debt marking market stabilizing somewhat. Apple is not the first mega cap to go and tap the market. Last week, Meta sold about $8.5 billion uh, in what was only its second ever bond sale. The other thing for Apple is that this would be the first bond sale since August when they sold around $5.5 billion to fund share buybacks and dividend payments. And I think the expectation from Apple's perspective is that this year we could meet or exceed around $100 billion in shareholder returns. And Bloomberg saw saying that this new sale could fund that along with sort of cor general corporate purposes, uh, CapEx, working capital. Um, but yeah, interesting timing given the data that I know is coming later this week, John. I was looking at use of proceeds and it was basically just everything, everything listed there, yeah. including <laughs> capital returns. Ed, thank you for that, mate. There is a sense, there is a window here ahead of the debt ceiling mess to issue debt. 30 to 35 billion of US high-grade bond issuance expected this week, according to the team here at Bloomberg. Kathy Jones of Swab saying just that. Maybe this is some companies trying to get out ahead of all of that. Sticking with tech, City Stuart Kaiser staying along the sector saying this. The tech thesis is less clean than to start the year, but we don't see a compelling sector alternative at this point. Stuart Kaiser joins us right now. Stuart, are we saying Tina's still a thing? There is no alternative to this. <laughs> hey, Jonathan, good morning. Look, I, I think from a tech perspective, yeah, it's, it's, you know, you're in a situation where sure valuation has pushed higher and, and we've definitely seen significant flows come into the space. But we do think there's still room for long only investors in particular to add to exposure. And, you know, you've, you've highlighted a, broad, a lot of risks this morning around growth, around credit, around sentiment. And you know, if that's the case, we do think the tech sector is is a good place to kind of be in that situation. So yeah, we're we're still on the sector, but but would you know acknowledge that that things have obviously changed quite a bit year to date. Stuart, I always wait this Sunday afternoon. I'm logged onto the Bloomberg. I'm doing my work for the week ahead, and your note always drops right there, right on cue. And your note this week started off with this, and I thought it was interesting. Markets were risk off for the week. But we are very surprised by the rally on payrolls. Investors seem happier about not bad growth data than concerned about hawkish wages. Now, Stuart, is good news simply good news at the moment? And how sustainable is that? Yeah, look, I, I think it, particularly right around, you know, when we started to get the, the, the regional bank stress, people started to really worry about recession risks and a pullback in credit. And I think what that did is it po probably put growth, you know, as priority number one over inflation for a period of time. And, and that's clearly what traded on Friday, right, which was, you know, a strong payrolls number, though with negative revisions and a very, very hot wage number. But the, the market seemed to really embrace the payroll side of it. You know, we didn't see this kind of short term rapid deterioration in economic growth data that people would fear. And, and for that reason, the market moved higher. Um, I'd also say and we mentioned in the same note is that you had a tremendous amount of really kind of tail risk kind of hedging in the system. So I think there were some people that were maybe, you know, clenching their teeth a little bit, a bit about a, a big downward surprise. And when that didn't materialize, a lot of that positioning probably got cleaned up a little bit on Friday. There seems to be some belief as well that we can enjoy this date without the threat of higher interest rates. From your perspective, Stuart, in your opinion, just how high is the hurdle to another hike of the Fed? Um, look, I mean, they said they're data dependent. So, you know, as you, you talk to Andrew Hollenhorst and our econ team, and we, we do expect a hike in June. So in our view, it's, it, it's possible, it's in play, and it, it's largely going to be determined by the data as it comes in. And, and that's why we were so surprised on Friday. That was the, you know, the hottest wage print we've seen since March of 2022. Certainly good to get the Fed's attention. Um, inflation, we have two more inflation prints and another job print before, before the FOMC. So, uh, you know, to me, June is, is kind of still in play. I know the markets aren't pricing that, so it's, it's data dependent. And, and that means to me, you know, you could get higher yields uh, in June. I just want to pick up on the market pricing right now. PacWest is fading. That stock was positive. It was through and approaching about 750. The stock coming just short of that, in and around that in today's session. It's pulled back to about 683. Not many people are constructive on this sector right now, Stuart. So I wasn't surprised to see the word cautious in your note on some of these banks. But you said until, cautious until 
private capital buys assets without a federal backstop. Stuart, can you talk me through just how you're thinking about this sector at the moment? Yeah, look, John, it's a it's a hugely it's a large and hugely complex issue. So we've really just tried to simplify it down. And that's until we see private investors willing to put cash into the space without, you know, a federal backstop or the FDIC absorbing losses, then we're going to remain cautious because what that's telling us is that institutional money does not see value in that space right now. And if they don't see value in the space, you know, I, I don't understand enough about it to, you know, to, to get involved. So, I mean, if you look at the deals that have happened, whether that's, you know, in Europe or, or the, you know, the, the three in the U.S. so far, you know, the FDIC has taken has written an 11 figure check in most cases to support those deals. And from my perspective, as, as an individual investor, I just don't think you could put your money to work in that space while, while that's ongoing. Stuart, it's amazing to see the S&P financials on the S&P 500 sit right on top of that 2007 peak. That means it's basically 16 years with no returns from that peak point to point from then to now. Stuart, do you think that maybe after the bust of the last 12 months in big tech that maybe we might be saying the same thing at the index level on the S&P 500 in 10 years time? You mean an extended period of, of sort of flat, flattish returns? Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, anything's possible, Jonathan, but I, I guess I would uh, my pushback there would be, you know, the equity markets have worked in higher inflation and higher rates, you know, environments historically. And, and really what the markets want is some form of clarity. So, you know, I think if we have a have some clarity on the rates outlook, some clarity on the inflation outlook, even if it's at a level that that the Fed doesn't love, um, you know, that equity markets can still work in that environment. And remember, the S&P 500 is a dynamically rebalanced portfolio, right? That, that's constantly increasing the weight of the highest ROE businesses in the world. So, you know, I don't see why, why we'd be sort of dead money for a 10-year period. Um, realize valuation is a little high, and I realize there's a lot of challenges out there right now. But, you know, I think if you step back big picture, if you were to get rates volatility down, get some clarity on, on the inflation outlook, I still think equities can work. Risk reward obviously isn't great. And when you can get 5% yield in cash, obviously that's a high bar to get you back into equity. But, but no, I mean, I, I don't think we're, we're calling for a 10-year 10 10 year period of dead money at this point. Stuart, thanks for indulging me. Sometimes it's hard enough to get past next week, so why not look through the next decade? Stuart Kaiser there at City. Stuart, appreciate it, sir, as always. On the S&P 500, about 13 minutes into the session, we are positive by just 0.02%. Some of these gains out there fading at the moment. Coming up, the regional banks trying to rebound. The information that we have at this point is that the situation remains under control. The president is certainly looking at the options on the table. A conversation up next. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Pimco co-founder Bill Gross. That conversation at 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. The information that we have at this point is that the situation remains under control. I think there are indications that we are um, uh, in, in a better place, certainly, and we continue to watch the, uh, uh, watch the situation as it, as it unfolds. The president is certainly looking at the options on the table. I can say the administration is going to closely monitor uh, the market developments, including uh, the short-selling pressures on health, unhealthy, uh, unhealthy banks. It's quite literally my favorite phrase in Washington, D.C. We are closely monitoring markets. I still have absolutely no idea what that means. The regional banks this morning trying to stage a comeback. Pac West leading those names higher. This is Mohamed al of Queen's College, Cambridge, warns there may be another leg to this story. Now we have stage two where banks that are not particularly badly managed, they have issues, but they're not particularly badly managed, are suddenly vulnerable and the vulnerability to this path dependency, this multiple equilibrium. Let's bring in the team. Kelly Lines back with us alongside Shanali Vassar. Kelly, these gains on PacWest fading just a little bit. Yeah, this is a stock that opened 30% higher on the day, now up just about 20%. And I say just, John, still 
objectively a really big move, but relatively when we look at the moves on this stock we have seen of late, it may actually seem quite small because remember, this is a stock that is coming off of an 80% gain from Friday. Even with the gains, though, over this session and last, is still a stock that is down 70% so far this year, so we still have a long way to go to undo that damage. Now, it's interesting to see the move this morning, despite the fact that the bank said it is going to slash its dividend. Analysts don't seem too surprised by that move, actually saying that it makes sense considering the bank wants to focus uh, on capital building and the pace of that. So investors really seem to be taking it in stride as well. It is it raises a question, though, of whether or not we really have seen the worst of the selling pressure for both PacWest and some of its peers like Western Alliance, Zions, Comerica, others that have gotten caught up uh, really in just this negative sentiment around regional banks. There was a question at the end of last week if that selling pressure had been overdone, if really what we were seeing in terms of the price action matched what was happening with bank fundamentals. And we also are still awaiting potentially more positive catalysts in the future. Morgan Stanley in a note this morning talking about the idea of potential changes to FDIC deposit insurance. Of course, Sean, that is something that would require congressional buy-in. And for that reason, we'll be looking ahead to the Senate Banking Committee hearing with regulators that's scheduled for next Thursday. And trying to stay to recovery here, trying to rebound on Pack West on many names on the regional banking index, which has been absolutely hammered since early March. For the broader market, about 20 minutes into this session, the S&P 500 rolling over, turning negative, down by 0.1%. Yields higher at the front end by six basis points. Let's call it 398 on a two-year. Do we need a countdown clock, Shanali Basak, for the Senior Loan Officer Opinion <laughs> Survey, which comes out in about four hours' time? Uh, listen, this is a slow bleed. Remember, John, we have seen tightening standards for a number of quarters now. You really have to go back to the beginning of last year when you saw any easy and unchanged data when you looked at the loan officer surveys here. That was when banks were trying to capitalize on higher net interest income on the heels of rising interest rates. Now, there's some other interesting data that has come out on the heels of this report to take a look at to complement, really, the, the report that we're going to hear today. Goldman Sachs, for example, now reporting that 77% of respondents of their small business survey say that they're facing a credit crunch. And that is such a hard turn from a year ago when 77% were confident in their ability to access capital. So hard turn there. I think this is the ability to turn on a dime when we're watching the loan market here. I also like the special questions. Frankly, last time the banks were asked about the lending standards, they not only only said almost every type of loan was being tightened here in terms of the standards, but they also expected almost every type of loan type to deteriorate in quality. We saw that from the January survey. Are we going to see some very kind of negative tones here when we look at the commentary from the loan officers? Credit crunch, you said it, Shanali. Torsten Slock said it too over at Apollo. Torsten Slock over the weekend saying that these regionals face difficult issues, higher funding costs, lower asset prices, more regulation. Shanali, just how hard is it going to get for some of these banks once they get through the storm? Yeah, look at the immediate storm that we're seeing here. You see it in the intraday volatility here of all of these uh, stocks to begin with. But then again, I think the problem here is when you look at it, the horizon, that horizon just keeps getting further and further, John, when you think about the banking models that these firms have to contest to. To the point that Citigroup was making a little earlier, Stuart Kaiser, private capital is going to play a key Key role in this. You saw them step up with Pac West to some degree, but only with a form of collateralized loans here that they could feel safe with. We have not seen a wholesale shift into the private capital markets stepping up. So where does the funding come from if depositors are so flighty? And what is the business model even past this initial storm? Shanali, thank you. 693 right now on Pac West. Shanali Basak there. Kelly Knights, thank you very much. For the broader market, about 22 minutes into the session, your equity market on the S&P, slightly negative. We're down by about 0.1% with a sector price action. Here's Abby. John, well, today's small decline, this move to the downside, at least right now, it has everything to do with big tech sliding. Let's take a look at the S&P 500 IMAP. We will see tech as the worst sector down about half a percent. It's the sector's big weighting to the index that's really creating a problem. Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, Amazon, Meta, Broadcom, these stocks are all lower. Consumer discretionary also uh, a lower, and that includes Amazon, of course. To the upside, though, is one that we have not seen all that much in recent weeks. Energy up 1.4 percent. This says oil is climbing higher again at $73 per barrel. In fact, over the last two days, we have energy higher up 4.1 percent, even as uh, oil up till today had been siding for multiple weeks. John, a little bit of a reprieve for the energy sector. Abby, thanks for that. As we kick off the trading week, looking ahead to some inflation data later on this week. Your trading diary up next.
25 minutes into the session, just turning a little bit lower on the S&P 500. Softer here, negative by 0.1%. That's the price action. Let's get to the trading diary, the highlights of the week ahead. President Biden speaking on the airlines at 1.45 Eastern time. The highly anticipated senior loan officer survey at 2 p.m. later on this afternoon. The main financial stability report coming later as well and Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashgari discussing wages too. Tomorrow it's the President's debt limit meeting with congressional leaders, the US CPI report out on Wednesday and finally PPI and another round of jobless claims on Thursday from New York City. That does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV and good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.